2020 meeting of the World Economic Forum, one of the primary think tanks managing economic and fiscal assets and resources cross borders, alongside other groups like the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund, occurred between January 21, 2020 and January 24, 2020 in Davos Clusters, Switzerland. Amidst the rising threat of coronavirus, a slowing global economy, and rising demand for cuts to carbon emissions, the world's economic experts and leaders discussed the topic of stakeholders for a cohesive and sustainable world. After months of rising movements for climate action around the world, such as the Green New Deal and its respective Sunrise Movements, resurgent think tanks in Canada and Britain, like the Natural Resources Defense Council and youth groups like Fridays for Future at the helm of Greta Thunberg, with anti-fossil fuel protests around the world, most commonly in Western Europe, Australia, Canada, the United States, and Eastern Asia, the world's economic leaders responded to the pressure and decided to open up dialogue on how to take responsible economic steps to decrease carbon emissions. Greta Thunberg, a Swedish climate activist known as the Voice of the Planet, gave a highly controversial, charged, and inspiring speech about how the need to take action on climate change is a huge necessity. President Trump, who has had a long history of denying scientific theories and research and huge displays of incompetence and inaction on the issue of climate change, having rolled back dozens of Obama-era regulations on statutes, clean air and water restrictions, protected lands and conservation efforts, as well as carbon tax or tariffs, announced that his administration would be working alongside the leaders of the World Economic Forum to announce his hallmark project, a trillion trees. Immediately, some of the world's largest conservation think tanks and corporations that dwarf even the Swedish Fridays for Future or the American Sunrise Movement, such as the World Wildlife Foundation, the Wildlife Conservation Society, the BirdLife International Society, and Restore Our Planet, quickly hopped on and rubber-stamped the proposal, co-sponsoring the legislation and allocating representatives to the Trump administration to start mapping out how such a proposal could work. However, backlash from the scientific community quickly arose. Reading the proposal quickly makes it obvious that no scientific experts, environmental engineers, or even conservation experts or advisors of any kind were consulted in the writing of the details. Second of all, such a project could face serious roadblocks in how large of a project it is, and it would likely take a cross-border international effort of hundreds of billions of dollars in international task forces and years of planning and construction to pull it off. How the administration planned on working out this logistical nightmare was never clearly stated. And third of all, although a monumental undertaking, this proposal would not come nearly close to even fulfill the United States' commitments to the Paris Climate Accords of 2015, which were of course disavowed by the Trump administration in the former half of President Trump's current term. This project is a step in the right direction, but it is not a cure-all fix-all, which is completely how it has been covered as it's been marketed online, in television, and in the White House press conferences on the subject. And through this hellscape of battling corporate interests, logistics yet to be figured out, misinformation everywhere surrounding the topic, and above all else, a lack of actual science behind the legislation, the question must be asked, is this proposal achievable? And if so, is it worth it? The essence of this topic will be broken down in a way that makes it easy to understand for our audience. We will cover the policy of a trillion trees in several ways. First of all, we will discuss the actual policy. What does the proposal stated by the administration actually wish to accomplish? What is the bread and butter of the law itself? Second of all, we will discuss certain criticisms of it. Why is this proposal criticized by many scientists? What are its major problems that will need to be kinked out? Third of all, we will propose a list of suggestions by us amateur climate scientists to the administration, showing them how to maximize the potency of this proposal. Fourth of all, we will look at historical precedents and scientific studies and journals to attempt to answer the question of whether or not this project is actually achievable. Fifth of all, we will observe the repercussions of having implemented this new policy, both positive and negative. And lastly, we will cover the ultimate question, 
is the policy moral? And should the normal, informed, and concerned citizen put their full weight behind this seemingly insurmountable task? This proposal has been touted by numerous climate-savvy groups across the world for generations. In 1977, the African group, the Green Belt Movement, headed by Wangari Maathai, launched their Billion Tree Plan, which would later grow into the Trillion Tree Plan. A climate activist and democratic rights and women's rights advocate, as well as the face of the anti-autocracy movement during Kenya's military dictatorship in the 1970s, she founded many small projects that employed Kenyan youth and young women into cultivating the soil and bringing physical beauty to the countryside by planting hundreds of millions of native plants and trees, inspiring other activists in Ethiopia, Egypt, Rwanda, Nigeria, and Djibouti to begin their own projects of planting trees. Although the Green Belt movement was violently cracked down upon and censored in Kenya for its quote-unquote seditious behavior in the 1990s, despite its unilaterally non-violent and non-militant doctrines, and Wangari Maathai herself passed away in 2011 after receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, her brave actions for democracy and the climate cause have led to the rise of the Trillion Tree Movement. Other organizations, such as Plant for the Planet Foundation, have since taken up the battle cry, and climate activists around the world have continued to fight for the principles of the Trillion Tree Plan. President Trump has committed to bringing the United States to task in its plans to get on board with the Trillion Tree Movement. The Trillion Tree Campaign was taken up by President Trump in the aforementioned World Economic Forum in Switzerland earlier this year. The United Nations' so-called Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is supposed to occur between 2020 and 2030, has been spearheaded by the WAO and UNEP which turned the Trillion Tree Plan into a series of hundreds of pieces of complicated legislation assigned to each country, with the goal of implementing a wave of laws where nations around the world may pledge allegiance to the movement. This project has not only included aspects about tree planting, but also included three monumental treaties on climate change targets signed by the United Nations member states in Paris for COP21 in 2015, Copenhagen, and Bonn for COP23 in 2017, and Madrid for COP25 in 2020. While it would take our team hours to comb through the literally thousands of pieces and strings of laws and regulations that make up the Trillion Tree Campaign, we can summarize a few of its key points. The Trillion Tree Campaign is aimed at, quote, bringing o about a world where the nation's tree cover is expanding, not shrinking, end quote. It is achieving this through a three-pronged project. First of all, they are, quote, leveraging climate finance and ecotourism revenues to protect forests, end quote. This can best be interpreted using the growing money governments are giving worldwide to efforts of ecotourism and conservation research to try and enact stricter forest codes and protection legislation for endangered forests at the regional and national levels in legislatures across the globe. These so-called forest codes set out a strict set of regulations that limit the amount of forest that is open to commercial use and development. I will give an example, the Amazon rainforest. The Amazon rainforest once faced some of the worst deforestation in the world. Due to its vast size, it has often become the target of attempts at development. There are many parties involved, as the Amazon rainforest covers trillions and hectares across half a dozen countries. Rubber tappers who wish to harvest the rich resources of the Amazon are constantly in conflict with representatives from Brazil's growing soybean industry, which wish for the Brazilian government to grant them access to greater swaths of Amazonian lands for them to expand land used in agricultural production. They also must contend with the international team of scientists that constantly monitor the Amazon, gathering data about its range of species, collecting numbers about the state of the climate, and measuring the region's rich biodiversity, as well as the native Brazilian tribes that have lived in the Amazon rainforest for millennia and consider it their rightful home. In 2003, under the charismatic climate change advocate President Lula da Silva, the amount of rainforest put under protection and federal conservation was doubled to nearly 37% of the rainforest, 
and 80% of the non-protected rainforest was put under one of these so-called forest codes, meaning that it was then illegal to cut down trees in these areas. In 2018, after the election of President Jair Bolsonaro, the forest code was weakened in two areas. First of all, the amount of strictly non-protected rainforest under the forest code was decreased to 65%. But second of all, the forest that was protected by the forest code's laws were changed by charter, to where the legislation was amended with numerous ambiguities. For example, it became legal for a farmer to cut down deceased or dying trees with little to no actual evidence in a provincial court, and you could apply for government grants to cut down trees for certain reasons, such as an interference to private property, a hindrance to agriculture, and certain kinds of development. These changes, although seemingly small, allow many citizens to find loopholes through such ambiguities by cutting down trees and then arguing in court that they were legally correct under the Charter. The Trillion Tree Campaign aims to end these kinds of ambiguities and loopholes, while strengthening the actual amount of forest protected by the federal government and simultaneously revitalizing forest codes all across the world. We can see evidence of this in countries like Canada, where dozens of laws have been passed, preserving millions of hectares of land for purposes like native protection, conservation of Canadian plants, safeguarding biodiversity, or decreasing stormwater runoff into major estuaries and bodies of water. Sound familiar? In dozens of nations around the world, organizations like the Trillion Trees Campaign have stepped in to foot the bill and negotiate better deals for protectors of forest codes under the law. The second part of the three-part mission of the Trillion Trees Campaign includes, quote, showing local innovations in forest conservation sustainability, end quote, and, quote, including examples of community forest management, end quote. Although, as with the previous task, it is not cut and dry, it is hard to determine what the Trillion Trees group is actually doing when they describe it as such, but they are likely talking about the demonstration of greater usage of sustainable practices, such as rotating farming fields and planting two crops a season. A greater use of sustainable practices, especially in the Amazon, has allowed for greater deals of productivity throughout the entire process, and despite the fact that the Amazon's regulations have gradually grown stricter, bit by bit, limiting the amount of land available to farmers and the agricultural industry, not only the profits but also the total volume of soybeans out of Brazil has continued to steadily grow. This group of more sustainable practices have revolutionized the Brazilian soybean industry and made Brazil's economy one of the most competitive in the world. The third part of the three-part mission of the Trillion Trees campaign is, of course, expected, saying, quote, including examples of natural forest restoration, end quote. Obviously, actually planting trees is the main task of the Trillion Trees campaign. The Trillion Trees movement has planted trees in over 120 countries. However, its current hubs are located in Peru, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Congo, Madagascar, Colombia, Brazil, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. As you can tell, the majority of the areas the Trillion Trees campaign conducts its business in are placed in developing nations, either in Africa or South America. So far, the Trillion Trees movement has planted around 13 billion trees across hundreds of countries. Those are the guts of the proposal that the Trump administration is spearheading. But why are scientists seemingly backing down the wall on the whole issue? Why might this proposal actually cause more harm than good in terms of carbon emissions? There has been a groundswell of criticism from many scientific experts and climatologists on certain issues that they believe could pose a relatively large hindrance to the project at large. Naturally, planting an additional one trillion trees to combat climate change is a large step, and any organization, even the administration, would be remiss to delude themselves into thinking that there will not be logistical struggles and endless bureaucracy behind closed doors. So what concerns do the climate science community have in regards to the Trillion Trees project? Many legitimate and fair questions have yet to be answered. 
and whether the administration would be able to fix some of the issues that plague the Trillion Trees project the moment it begins in the United States. Joseph Veldman, part of the original group of 46 climate scientists who criticized the initiative after its suggestion in Davos for the World Economic Forum, worries about both forest diversity and planting trees without the consultants of the climate science movement. Planting non-native trees to an area can cause serious problems. The original initiative, suggested by the administration, seemed to suggest the planting of trees native to North America, such as the oak tree, ash tree, poplar tree, or birch tree. The issue with this proposal is that those kinds of trees are not native to the vast majority of the world's surface. Planting oak trees in the Southeast Asian jungles of Malaysia and Indonesia would pose serious threats. First of all, invasive species such as the oak tree being introduced to a jungle biome, which is much hotter and more humid than an oak tree is naturally able to tolerate, could devastate the oak tree, as it would not be suited to such a climate. Planting trees like that in environments like that of Indonesia could come at a detriment to the whole project. Dr. Veldman worries that the transition could kill off the trees planted near the equator of the North American origin, and all of the trillion trees planted between 2030 and 2020 could be dead by 2050, or at least a vast majority of them could be. Another issue with planting invasive species from the United States or Canada into a tropic or polar environment could be an opposite problem. If an invasive species had the capacity to survive in such a new environment, then it would likely be able to smother out the natural species of trees in the region. Veldman asserts that if a trillion trees are planted now between 2020 and 2030, then several hundred billion trees could die in the places where these new artificial forests are put into place, which would leave the number of trees being planted roughly equal every year, representing neither a large net gain of trees or net loss. Although the project would remain valuable due to the fact that it would halt for at least a decade the rapid acceleration of deforestation, it would still fail to make a large impact on carbon emissions, which is, of course, the main aim of the project. Joseph Feldman reminds us also of the phenomenon known as a dark patch, when excess trees and snowy climates can create patches of shadow on the ground that actually absorb more heat and exacerbate global warming. Another major problem that Joseph Feldman reminds us is the trivial issue of wildfires. Drier trees cannot retain as much moisture compared to a tree adapted to the jungle could catch a fire a lot more quickly, creating wildfires in ecosystems that are usually much more resilient to fire, such as rainforest ecosystems. Ensuring that all trees planted are planted in the right places for their right species and the right locations to prevent natural disasters from occurring will be a massive undertaking that only the administration and the World Economic Forum will need to assess alongside the Trillion Trees campaign. There also seems to be a growing worry from this team of climate scientists that the political rights of populations where the Trillion Trees project will be taking place could potentially be at risk. A Trillion Trees would take up a fairly large amount of land on the Earth's surface. There is a concern among this group of climate scientists that the administration will not regard the people for which they are planting trees on such land. Everyone has political rights and rights to the land that they own, and in finding space for a trillion new trees, cutting corners without the permission of the residents that live in specific places is undoubtedly not the answer. In addition, much of the land that would be reforested, for example in the Amazon rainforest of Brazil, the central African jungles of the Congo, and the rainforests of southeastern Asia and Indonesia, would be owned by native populations, who often have a complicated political relationship with the governments that rule over their nations. Most native populations receive a large degree of relative autonomy, and their rights to the land that is their ancestral plain would be hard-pressed for the Trillion Trees campaign to violate. An alliance of 42 indigenous tribes from around the globe wrote a letter to the World Economic Forum, reading, quote, we have cared for our lands and forests and the biodiversity that they contain for generations. With the right support, we can continue to do so for generations to come. In fact, a recent study from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America actually found that while the Amazon rainforest has recently become more carbon neutral 
not carbon negative, due to ramping up development and increasing deforestation between 2003 and 2016, the portions of the Amazon rainforest owned by natives saw the least amounts of deforestation, the healthiest portions of the rainforest, and the greatest amount of carbon dioxide neutralized from the air. All the while, said indigenous populations continue to live off of the land in a sustainable way while maintaining the land's biodiversity in parallel. Ensuring that the indigenous peoples of the world do not have their lands infringed upon will be a trivial issue that the Trillion Trees campaign will have to tackle as it moves forward with the support of the United States government. But what else can the United States government do to ensure the potency of these Trillion Trees? There are 3.2 trillion trees in the world, according to NOAA's Domestic Research Institute. Scientific American puts that number at slightly less, around just 3 trillion. In both cases, the number of trees added, for which the aim is 1 trillion, would be a large influx and huge addition numerically to the overall number of trees worldwide. Although that sounds like a lot, being a numerical increase of almost 31%, how much land would 1 trillion trees actually take up? We know that the number of trees worldwide has shrunk considerably in recent years, and the organization 10 Trees estimates that we have lost around two-thirds of the number of trees worldwide as we did in the year 1600. That means we have literally lost several trillion trees. According to the United Nations RED program, trees cover just under 30% of the world's total land area meaning that an increase of 1 trillion trees would increase the total percentage of the world's land area covered by trees by around 9%, or to around 38.5% total. This proves that there is definitely enough land space in the world for an additional 1 trillion trees to be planted. But planting 1 trillion trees over 10 years would translate to around 100 billion trees being planted annually between 2020 and 2030. However, as we are already losing 15 billion trees a year due to deforestation and urbanization, every year between 2020 and 2030 would see approximately a net gain of 85 billion trees a year. That's still an excellent modicum of growth, but how could we do better? To begin with, let's talk about how important biodiversity is to forests. Let's go to a real-world example, the Shenandoah National Forests in Virginia. Prior to its declaration as a national forest and placement under federal protection in 1935, the development of northwestern Virginia had seriously damaged the integrity of the biodiversity in Shenandoah. Due to the 33rd and 340th highways cutting Shenandoah into several parts, the life cycle in the park was seriously interfered with. First of all, these roads that had frequent traffic halted the hunting grounds of the natural predators in Shenandoah such as the Virginian black bear and the bobcat. As these apex predators were prevented from crossing these major highways, they were not able to hunt as effectively, as they exhausted the areas they were limited to more quickly. This caused, over time, a near extinction of the bobcat in western Shenandoah, and a large resurgence in the deer and squirrel populations in the region. As both of these consumers eat plants, a natural part of their diets, more trees and foliage were consumed, as there were no predators to keep the consumers in check, severely weakening Shenandoah's western portions. However, when the Shenandoah National Forest was put under federal protection, the Forest Service was able to implement small areas of tree cover weaving around the highways, reconnecting all of Shenandoah's parts, and allowing the national hunting cycles of predators in the region to be restored, gradually building back the western parts of these forests. These small areas of tree cover are now known as corridors, and we are seeing greater efforts by environmentalists and forest conservation groups to plant corridors between segments of urban forests. As such corridors not only add the total number of trees to a forest, but over time can regenerate trees within the core of individual forest segments thickening out tree cover. This is extremely important, as a large part of those 15 billion trees lost every year come from the effects of thinning forests. If the life cycle of a forest is broken up, the potentiality for trees to die due to an excess of consumer species is much higher, leading to the thinning of tree cover. 
This leads to more grass growing on the ground, as less young trees are sprouting up. Although grass is a natural part of forested environments, they represent one kind of ground cover in forested areas, alongside moss, rocks, pine needles, dirt, foliage, fungi, and many others. Grass is a fast-growing plant, meaning that not only does it have an excess of grass growing and make it much harder for these other kinds of ground cover to thrive, it also makes the lives of young saplings much harder, as they have to compete with the fast-growing grass for sunlight, minerals, and water supply. This is also bad for a forest's overall carbon footprint, as grass does not recycle greenhouse gases as efficiently as young trees, and the balance of power and ground cover changing from young trees in favor of grasses can trigger what is known as a trophic cascade, a dynamo effect where a thick forest slowly thins out to become a thin forest, and eventually a mere woodland before thinning out completely to a grassland or a savanna, which is far less efficient and not only storing carbon as terms of a thick forest, but also housing as much biodiversity, which can, in the long run, bring up the carbon footprint of the entire region. For example, the Atlantic forest, the rainforest on the Atlantic coast of South America, has shrunk considerably due to the rapid urbanization of cities such as Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and Montevideo. One of the main reasons why the Atlantic forest is shrinking so rapidly is the fact that it has been split up into multiple pieces by Brazil's suburban development. Extending corridors numbering 1 billion trees total between each of these splices of the Atlantic forest could add an additional 85 billion trees to Brazil and Uruguay without any interference from tree planting corporations. If we were able to decrease the total number of trees being lost due to a lack of biodiversity in thinning forests by using corridors to agree of 75%, the impact of a trillion trees project could be far more impactful. A second thing to look at is forest diversity, the difference between monocultures of trees and polycultures of trees. Forests are not made up exclusively of a single tree. Forests could be made up of multiple kinds of trees, with a single tree making up a majority or a plurality, but no natural forest is monolithic. In addition, not all flora and fauna in a forest are trees. As previously stated, ground cover plays just as vital a role into the life cycle of a forest as well as the forest's overall health. To give you all an example of just how fragile and delicate the state of a monoculture of trees can be, we can turn to arguably the most ambitious tree planting plan in the modern history of the world, behind the Trillion Trees Project. I'm talking, of course, about the Great Green Wall of the People's Republic of China. Started in the 1970s by the Chinese Communist Politburo to combat the deforestation and desertification of provinces like Ningxia, Inner Mongolia, Heilongjiang, and Jilin from the expanding Gobi Desert. They correctly believed that if the Chinese could block the advancing desert by planting a forest ecosystem that would be rich in moisture to lock the desert from migrating, they could greatly delay or even completely halt the process of desertification in northern China. Thus, China put its massive industry to work. The purpose of the Politburo's project was efficiency. They wished to finish the project in as little of a time as possible in a way that could utilize China's vast industry and massive working class to manufacture the forest as fast as they could. This meant, in the eyes of Chinese leaders, that they should mass produce a single type of tree, and then get unskilled workers to plant them in the simplest formation possible for their province, such as a grid, for as little pay as they would accept the work for. Thus, in 1978, a chunk of China's massive industrial might began pumping out 49 million Chinese poplar trees a year, a native and fast-growing tree. Slowly by slowly, the Great Green Wall thickened. China's factories and manufacturing plants in provinces like Anhui, Hubei, and Henan supplied workers in Inner Mongolia and Ningxia with millions of Chinese poplar seedlings every year. The provincial politburos of each province bordering Mongolia would then distribute said seeds to individual towns, parishes, and communes near the Gobi Desert, and offering cash incentives to all citizens who volunteered to plant a certain quota of these Chinese poplars around their homes and in areas close to the desert. In time, 
as China became more and more industrialized, China began ramping up the project through aerial seeding, and suddenly, they were able to plant hundreds of thousands of trees in one flight. This accelerated the number of trees being planted annually. As monumental as this project has been, and as useful to combating China's desertification and carbon emissions as this has been, the fact that the Great Green Wall is composed upwards of 96% by Chinese poplar trees has posed huge issues to the project in the past. As China's cities have become more polluted, certain irritants in the soil coming from cities exhaust farmland more rapidly and make it harder for Chinese poplars to grow. As almost all of the Great Green Wall is made up of Chinese poplars, there are no other kinds of trees to fill that gap when a certain segment of land has been exhausted of nutrients. In the United States, of course, farmlands are rotated, and sometimes slow-growing crops are even planted in exhausted lands in the interim. But as only one kind of plant is being produced in China for this Great Green Wall, that is not really possible. In addition, the monoculture status of the Great Green Wall has posed large issues in the past. In 2008, devastating winter storms swept across northern and eastern China. As the Chinese poplar is relatively vulnerable to cold and snow, nearly 10% of the entire project was wiped out between 2008 and 2009. Again, the fact that the project is composed of almost completely Chinese poplars means that when ch natural disasters that Chinese poplars are especially susceptible to, there are nearly no other trees for the project to bounce back on and regenerate from. In addition, the introduction of insects that prey on Chinese poplar trees, but not other kinds of trees, such as the Anoplophora in 2000, nearly 1 billion trees were lost from the project, which is thought to have set back the project's finish date nearly 19 years, from 2031 to around 2050. But what does this story teach us about the Trillion Trees project? We urge the administration to consider this cautionary tale. Monocultures of trees are the easiest to mass manufacture, and planting a trillion trees that are all the same type would be the easiest for the administration to work with. But it would also arguably do the least impact. Every ecosystem and biome require a different kind of tree. In Kenya, the native acacia tree, as well as certain kinds of shrubbery and tall grass, are already being planted by the Trillion Trees campaign. In Brazil, the Amazon rainforest is being reinforced by Barragona, Wakongo, and Conta trees, as well as other kinds of bushes and vines that are native to the region. The point is, you do not need to, at all, look far to find examples of effective tree planting that makes valid scientific sense for a specific ecosystem without straying into the dangerous wonders of monoculture. Although it takes longer time to set into motion, diverse and supported forests last much longer and do much more impact than monocultures. And, as previously stated, by also planting certain kinds of ground cover and limiting the growth of grass, an estimated 60 billion trees could be salvaged and added to the project without any additional grants. Another important thing to note is urban forests. Urban forests make up a significant portion of carbon dioxide emissions and taking in each year, and planting green spaces in urban centers can and should contribute to a large tally of a trillion trees that the administration has signed up for. This sentiment has been echoed by numerous signs around the world. However, there is a point to be made for the fact that such complicated measures for planting trees seem ridiculous and unfeasible on the numerical basis of one trillion. So, how possible is it for the administration to take all of these potential improvements into account but still finish this whole project in a little under a decade at just nine and a half years? historical precedents to determine whether or not the Trillion Trees project actually has an achievable goal. Planting a trillion trees is an unprecedented and truly gargantuan task. It will require a decade of hard work 
if it is even achievable at all. Now, we will observe some of history's largest tree planting operations in modern history to gain a scope of how the Trillion Trees project could be achieved in the coming years. One of the more recent and also more moderately successful tree planting operations cross borders was Mr. Beast's project, which is globally known as Team Trees, and it had been aimed at planting 20 million trees in a time span of three months between fall 2019 and the beginning of the 2020 year, and it actually ended up planting around 21.7 million trees, which is more than expected. So, why was this project so successful? And how was it actually accomplished? Well, according to the Team Trees website, they planted the trees by reaching out to different tree planting projects already on the ground and agreeing to finance them. Specifically, this manifested itself in 29 projects in 15 countries around the world. This means that Mr. Beast took in money that he had raised through his fundraisers, connected to Team Trees, and distributed it to corporations that were already working on planting trees in certain nations around the globe. This might be, be the most feasible course of action when you consider the Trillion Trees project from the perspective of the administration in the context of it trying to appeal to the climate action movement. First of all, the Trillion Trees project independent of the administration is already doing this. Some of the suggestions that we suggested are actually already being implemented by the Trillion Trees campaign. They're working on the ground on a locality-by-locality -locality basis, recruiting young workers and professionals to plant native trees in a way that builds a more cohesive man-made forest, not the monocultures put into place by China, for example. Dozens of billions of trees are already planted every year by tree planting agencies and corporations, and that number is probably more than anyone knows for sure, at least on an annual basis. This is because there's no official way to recognize and validate tree planting agencies, or the number of trees that they plant each year in total. The administration would be well advised not to allocate too much of the Trillion Trees project to any specific cabinet office or department of the executive, but rather federalize it into a national project with multiple aspects of the administration putting their full weight behind it. For example, it would very likely be the responsibility of the State Department to manage the diplomatic aspect of overseeing such a project and coordinating with other countries around the world to distribute where and how certain and specific kinds of flora and fauna are to be placed. The Environmental Protection Agency, as well as the World Wildlife Fund and the Natural Resources Defense Council, would likely manage the legal and scientific aspect of it, leasing envoys and climatologists to negotiate with the administration and advise them for what to do with the resources that they have available at any given time. The distribution of planting materials and resources cross borders would very likely be a threat to national security, as such a large movement of people and commercial goods brings the opportunity and possibility of terror attacks through counterfeit materials, as well as a logistical problem for when things need to be convoyed cross borders. This part of the project will likely be overseen by the Department of Homeland Security and the Customs and Border Protections organizations, which can ensure that all American citizens, as well as citizens in general, are safe in the distribution of these resources. However, it is also important to note that not all of these trillion trees would be planted outside of the country. As President Trump declared it a priority for his administration, the possibility of a significant chunk of these trillion trees actually being planted here in the United States is very high. The Department of Housing and Urban Development would oversee and work in coordination with the aforementioned EPA, WWF, and NRDC in developing innovative tactics to plant trees in large cities as part of an urban forest development plan, subsidizing materials for green spaces, DIY gardens and parks, and greater maintenance of tree planting along roads in tight suburban areas will of course be encouraged. This will all occur, hopefully, alongside the support of the Department of the Interior, which will need to set up, out, and clear and realistic expectations on a state-by-state -state and even locality-by-locality -locality standpoint, setting out a quota of how many of the Trillion Trees each area of the country needs to plant in conjunction with the Trillion Trees campaign. An important recommendation that we wish to give the administration that goes along with it making more feasible is, 
honestly and very simply taking a step back. We've already addressed some of the very real dangers of a national government working on its own to try and implement a harsh climate regiment quota just on the basis of efficiency. Manufacturing industries and cheap labor of ethnic minorities come into play. And unfair workplace practices help monocultures of unstable tree populations to spring up. Those populations can only thrive as long as they are diverse. Billions of trees are planted every year. What tree planting organizations really need is oversight. Each tree planting organization works fairly independently. We have seen various occasions where, for a certain amount of time, tree planting agencies come together and unionize to get a goal accomplished before returning into the shadows and continuing their work out of the spotlight. Many of these organizations are underfunded, understaffed, and lack coordination with other organizations. While democratically elected Republican government like that of Trump's administration cannot force a manufacturing rollout to plant trees like the totalitarian government that China has in place, it does have some of the greatest surpluses of compliance, manpower, resources, and funds at its disposal out of any organized movement in the world. What these tree planting organizations really need is oversight. A large organization, like the administration, can provide an influx of volunteers, funds, and equipment to thousands of tree planting organizations around the world in exchange for those organizations doing the work of actually planting the trees. The administration will also organize and coordinate each of these individual efforts into a cohesive task force by drawing boundaries, setting quotas, and bringing up expectations. All of this will also be further assisted by the scientific mindset and climate expert influx that will occur as the administration brings figures in from the World Economic Forum. These bright minds can help the network of tree planting organizations to best distribute their resources and recommend that they function in a way that maximizes the potency of this Trillion Trees project. Now, all of these facts taken into careful consideration are wonderful to think about, and they are wonderful. However, putting the criticisms scientifically aside, what are the political repercussions of a project like the Trillion Trees campaign? What motivations could President Trump have having putting his full weight behind something so monumental like a trillion trees. And most monumentally of all, what is the effect that this trillion trees project will have on the critical 2020 general election this November here in the United States? Moreover, it is important to consider the effects of a possible successful Trillion Trees project, regardless of its feasibility. There are three very important negative effects that would come from enacting such a Trillion Trees project, and two of them have already been set into motion, as President Trump made a brief mention of the Trillion Trees project at his 2020 State of the Union speech. The first of these negative effects is the way that the Trump administration's expressions on the Trillion Trees projects harnesses and exploits the press. As the Trump administration has marketed the Trillion Trees project for a cure-all of sorts for the climate crisis, right-wing think tanks, talk radio, and media outlets have jumped on this as a major success of the administration in the battle against climate change, and have used it thus far to discredit any further climate policy by calling it radical and extremist, consistently citing the president's quote-unquote cure-all solution. More respectable news networks will give airtime to this proposal. This may not seem like much, but it is important to consider how audiences respond to information. It has been repeatedly proven that audiences will continue to believe false information after it is debunked. According to the news source outlet Vox, obvious lies can actually leave people oblivious to the motivation of the speaker, and at many times make great believable soundbites of propaganda. Even allowing this program to get a platform for 10 seconds is 10 seconds not being spent on Scott Pruitt, the Chesapeake Bay, or the massive dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Polling data shows that the media inflecting a single climate issue to their environmental column for that week makes people less likely to consider climate change an important issue, as they are only presented a small fraction of the issues that are going on. 
This leads to the second effect in play. The mainstream media, which has readily and ably supported this proposal and shed it in a light that makes it sound like a pure cure, there has been some concern by political scientists that voters on the fronts, indicating centrists, of whom the environment is a major issue, could be swung to President Trump's side in the general election this November, which could help him to secure a second term. Whether or not you support President Trump or oppose his re-election, it is undeniable that this consensus of the mainstream media, which has rallied behind his administration on this singular issue in the context of his climate policy, will give him a crucial boost in the polls and his approval ratings, both of which he needs assistance in. The reason why this will have a negative effect, however, is a little bit deeper than the politics in play, and it actually has very little to do with which candidate you support. This kind of gaslighting that the media is handing to the Trump administration reserves the risk of actually decreasing the awareness and consciousness of the people at large on the issue of climate change. Making this project, the Trillion Trees Project, seem like a cure-all to climate change would be a gross overrepresentation of what it is aiming to do, and it might dissuade center-left voters from advocating so hard for proposals like the Green New Deal or the resolution for a broad carbon tax on companies in the upper class. But is this really a problem? Does the trillion trees fix climate change, or at least from the perspective that the scientific community understands at this point? Well, a single tree could be able to sequester around a quarter of a ton of carbon dioxide in the 10-year period of 2020 to 2030, in which the trillion trees project will likely take place. This means that collectively, a trillion trees could likely sequester and lock away around 25 billion tons of carbon dioxide in a 10-year period. The atmosphere in total contains 43 billion tons of carbon dioxide and emissions by humans will continue to account for an additional 1.3 billion tons of carbon dioxide added a year. This means that, although carbon levels will likely shrink by about a quarter, they will not even be reduced to pre-industrial levels of the atmosphere. This means that climate change will still be a very real issue that will need to be tackled through other proposals and scientific solutions in the years of implementation of the Trillion Trees project. Underscoring climate change as a major problem must be emphasized over and over so that the electorate does not lose sight of the fact that the Trillion Trees project is only one powerful tool in the arsenal that humanity will need to use if we are to overcome the existential threats of climate change. The third negative effect to look at is that the implementation of the Trillion Trees project could be used by the Trump administration in an attempt to overshadow all of the harm that the administration has done to the environment in its tenure. They may even attempt to use the event to grant themselves scientific absolution on this particular topic. In his tenure in office so far, President Trump has rolled back many of the regulations that had been put in place in the latter half of President Obama's time in the White House. Clean air restrictions have been slashed, leading to a rising air pollution across the country. Clean water standards have been denigrated, which has led to more and more stormwater runoff in some of America's most important estuaries, notably the Chesapeake Bay, which has struggled to support its increasingly unsustainable ecosystem as Maryland's Governor Hogan has tried to implement support systems to keep it alive. Dozens of hectares of land that were previously protected by the government as federal property for conservation efforts have been returned for public usage and financial capital. Of course, numerous oil and gas pipeline projects have infringed on the rights of Native Americans across the nation, specifically upon the Navajos of Arizona, the Ochils of Florida, and most famously and controversially, upon the Sioux of North and South Dakota. Carbon taxes in various states like New York and California have been weakened. The coal industry has seen massive subsidies in areas like Pennsylvania and West Virginia, setting back two decades of progress in these departments. And of course, President Trump's overall public denial of climate change has seen the public's acceptance of the issue drop considerably. These changes are numerically quantifiable. Under President Obama, carbon emissions began to level off, beginning to actually decrease in the latter half of his term. Under President Trump, this decrease first began to stagnate and has actually begun to rise again. As previously stated, the Trillion Trees project is a huge step in the right direction. 
but it is by no means the only step that our country will need to take if we want any realistic shot at reversing global warming. So, with this in mind, we must ask ourselves the question, does the incredible good of this Trillion Trees project eclipse all of the bad that the Trump administration has done in its lackluster and incompetent tackling of the climate change issue? And, most importantly, looking at this from a philosophical perspective, would it be morally correct for the American people to support this proposal? The Trillion Trees Project is a very ambitious one. It aims to see the number of trees worldwide increased by nearly 30%, an additional 9% of the world's surface to be covered by forests. It would be one of the most ambitious, if not the most ambitious plan to tackle climate change to date, and it has not yet been observed in its full scope, as it's only recently begun. Founded out of a pet project of the Trump administration and signed off at Davos, Switzerland, 2020, during the World Economic Forum Conference, the Trillion Trees Project would be the administration's signature policy on climate change, and it would fit into the United Nations Decade of Sustainability Project, seeing the decade of 2020 to 2030 become a decade of sustainable action and green innovation. A great many concerns have been raised about the Trillion Trees Project's convenience, feasibility, coordination, and sustainability, as well as worries that it would infringe upon the political rights of indigenous groups or go against the political will of countries that open up their borders to the project. Many scientists have arisen to give the administration a greater overview of what they could do, and what they should do to help the process run more smoothly. But there are a great many questions about the Trillion Trees project that are yet to be answered. Does President Trump deserve our validation for making this right decision and bringing the country forward in a bipartisan effort to tackle climate change? And given that he is undoubtedly spitting this project into a token to be used in his re-election campaign, as well as a dissuading measure to the centrist electorate who believe that his inaction on climate change is not worth rewarding, is it moral for us American citizens to overlook that disingenuous political playing and focus on the scientifically valuable aspect of the proposal? There's no right answer to that question. But rather, it is one that each and every citizen must make for themselves. We encourage all of our viewers to remain conscious of the environment and steadfast in the fight against climate change, because only all of us working together can truly fix this.